Now today, I'm going to uh, share with you some of my experiences, successful or, or failing experiences, it all depends on you, your judgment. The title is A Few Candid Tips for PhD Students. Okay, let me start with a brief explanation of why a few candid tips, why for you? Okay, now studying, uh, for a PhD degree is a very risky business, a very risky investment. Risky in two senses. It could be a huge waste of your time because these five or six years are the best years of your life. You may end up with nothing or even worse. <laughs> so that is one, one side of the risk. Another side of the risk is that you may end up having the so-called permanent head damage. Mm -hmm. So I think as a survivor, uh, I can tell you something that you might wish to, to know as early as possible, okay? So that's why I agreed to come here and talk to you for about 40 minutes or 45 minutes. Uh, candid means that unpleasant. As always, candid advices are unpleasant to hear or probably beneficial to know, okay? So that's my promise. Overall, my advices or suggestions boil down to one point. The meaning of learning, study for a PhD degree or the whole point of getting a PhD degree is not that piece of paper it's not, it's not anything I, I can call academic qualification, is a transformation. So by studying for a PhD degree, especially if you get it, then that means you have successfully become your own advisor, your own supervisor. Now, what do I mean by that? What's the difference between a graduate student and a faculty advisor? Now, here are the six differences. And these differences are also the transitions you need to make. For example, the first one, to be an advisor means that you know what the gatekeepers want. Academia is a market. You need to know what those gatekeepers want. But it's very difficult to learn what those people want. All right, so that is the responsibility of your advisor. And by studying for a degree, eventually you obtain your advisor's perspective. You know the game, you know the community, you know the gatekeepers. Second point is to know your comparative advantages. Life is a competition. You need to be aware of your competitors. Right. And third point is more technical, uh, more operational, right to think read to write, self-critique, and self-editing. I'll be very honest with you, these are the four greatest challenges facing young graduate students. Right? Because every one of them has some presupposition, like why do we write to think? Some of you, I believe, especially if you are first year, you might believe that, how do you write a dissertation? You do research, think about it, you know what I'm going to write, and then you start writing. Wrong. That's the wrong order. Without writing, you can never think. Without writing, you can never think clearly. So all of those uh, four points, I'm going to talk about a little, a little bit more. And the fourth one is more on the science part of life. Life is an art, life is a science, and work intensely and then let go has to do with, not with art, but with science, with brain science, how our brain works. Fifth point, problems worthy of attack prove their worth by fighting back. This is just prepare you for frustrations. You have to be well prepared for frustrations. All of those agonies, all of those anxieties are 
unavoidable, unfortunately. Right. And the last one is a question. What is the life of a scholar? A living, a career, a calling, okay? Let me show you more. Now, this is the first point. Learn what gatekeepers care about, right? Now, academia, as I told you, is a business, is a club, exclusive club. It's also a ruthless arena, right? So if you want to get a degree, get a degree with honor, you need to be aware of what is the value that you're going to contribute to the existing academia. And for that reason alone, you need to find out what those people value, what do they want? Are you able to deliver what they need? Without delivering what they want, they will deny your entry. It's a very exclusive club. Now, fortunately, uh, you study for a degree. It doesn't mean that you have to go into academia. You can go to business. You can go to, um, you know, political circle, you can, you can become a high official. But whatever you do, you need to bear in mind that we come to this world to serve. And in order to serve, we need to know what people expect of us. Like if you are going to do business, you have to know the market. If you go to the government, you have to know what your boss wants, right? If you don't know what the chief executive wants, then you won't be able to climb up high on, on the ladder of bureaucracy. So this is this is the uh, a general point, but especially important for PhD students because you are now trying to enter an exclusive select club. If you don't choose to work on a worthwhile or valuable topic, you are doomed. Unfortunately, uh, yeah, that, that's the case. So here is a, a, a video by Professor Lawrence McEnany who used to teach at University of Chicago. Uh, you can find two, two videos on YouTube. Let me show you. Here is the highlight, absolute highlight. Dear friend of mine when I was a PhD student here, discovered journals by a woman in the lace part of the 19th century in England. She traveled around the world and every year she wrote a journal. And somehow they ended up in a library in Norwich. And she was over in Norwich one day and she stumbled into a back room and there's all these journals with tons of dust on them. She blew up the dust and she said, oh my gosh, it's amazing. This woman traveled the world for 30 years and wrote a journal every time. Came back here, wrote for Grant and said, oh, I want to spend three months studying this. And then she got her money and she went over to Norwich and she spent three months and she read the whole thing and she wrote it all up and she handed it to her committee and in an hour and a half, they sent it back and they said, you got to be kidding. She said, well, I'm going to get my dissertation. I mean, three now, right? They said, you've got to be kidding. Of course, we're not going to. Give you the PhD. And she said, but, 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 but nobody in the world knew what this woman said. Right, they said. And we still wish we didn't know <laughs> what she said because we do not. She said, it's original race. She said, I guarantee you it's new. And they said, that's right. It's new and it's original. But it is not ours. But just imagine if we were that poor woman. Uh, if you are not careful, you could very well end up being that woman. Work very hard on something, very confident that she has found some new knowledge, and just be immediately rejected by the committee. Um, we still wish we didn't know. You don't want to hear that at your dissertation or a defense or after the oral defense. So be very careful, talk to your advisor and do get his or her honest opinion about the topic you're going to work on. And that is very, very important. Now the second point, why Professor McEnany focused on knowledge? Now, if you watch the whole video, you will see that what he meant was valuable knowledge. Valuable to who? valuable to the academic club, to the community. 
how do you measure whether something is valuable or not? Uh, two standards. One has to be original. The other has to be the best. Right. And for that reason, you need to be very competitive. I'm not a very competitive person, but I'm quietly competitive, meaning that I constantly try to position myself, reposition myself by doing two par comparisons. One, I compare with my peers. I compare with other people who work in the same field on the same topic in terms of intelligence, diligence, perseverance, and plus one thing, stamina. And oftentimes, you may end up meeting with people who are, first of all, smarter than you. Second, work harder than you. There was no competition with those people. Right? If only two people are working on the same topic, you are one of them, the other guy is smarter than you, has more stamina, work harder than you, just give up. Just give up. Choose another one. The, the, the world is big. <laughs> okay. The other comparison is that you have to compare with your competitors in terms of data access, material, right? Raw materials, analytic equipment, and the third one, political security. Now, this is the focus of today's talk because it has to do with being young and growing out of uh, a young age. Why do I ask you to write in order to think? Because so far you have been very, very uh, successful in your study. You're a good student in high school, good student at university. That's why you ended up in this um, graduate program. But so far, you have been playing a role that I call a consumer of knowledge. You read, you learn, you memorize, generalize, and then you show off what you know, show off what you uh, generalize uh, to your professors during the examination. But now you're playing a different game. You become a creator of knowledge. And creation is always messy. You just look, even read, read, the, read, the, uh, read the Bible. When God was creating this universe, it was all messy. Right? Now similarly, look at any creative process. It has to be chaotic, messy. If you think that you can think through this chaos, they can think through the complexity. You are overestimating your intelligence, your memory, your brain power. So the only way to, for you to really think is to write. When should you start writing your dissertation? Day one. You may say, I have nothing to write. And that's why you have to write. But if you know what you write, what's the point of writing? Now, this sounds like a paradox, but this is my experience. You have to write. Write six hours a day. Nothing else is work. Going to classes, reading books, doing literature review, that's not work. Only writing is work. So don't overestimate yourself. The second point is read to write. Equally important. Many of my former students, they always ask me about how to do literature review. And I'm sure you have the same problem. I always ask, why do you have to read the literature? Right. So if you don't know your own size, how can you buy proper clothes? But how do you know your own size? You have to write. Only by writing, you know what you know, you know what you think, and then you start reading the literature, the literature becomes much, much smaller. So read to write. This is actually not uh, from me, it's uh, from uh, the advice comes from the former uh, department head at UC Berkeley, political science department. 
The third point, self-critique. I always tell my students that, that in terms of uh, judgment, in terms of intuition, even in terms of knowledge, you are just as good as me. The only difference between graduate student or uh, one of the major differences is that graduate students tend to be critical, but of other people. Right. Graduate students are well known for being dragon slayers. Right. You want to kill the, the dragon. You want to uh, knock down, defeat the giants in the field. All of those big name scholars, you think that they are nothing. I'm going to defeat all of them. That's fine. But the true challenge is that you need to use your critical power on your own, on yourself. It's very easy to criticize, right? Extremely easy to criticize, but don't indulge yourself with criticizing other people. Criticize yourself. Now, I once uh, had a workshop at Zhejiang University a group of uh, PhD students were talking about research proposals. So I asked, invite other graduate students to comment on each other's uh, uh, the, the PhD research proposal. And I said, now all of you make wonderful comments, very insightful, very constructive, but why don't you do the same to yourself? Why are you being so selfless? Why are you being so altruistic? We have to be self-interested. We have to take care of our own interests first. Now, you may think it is easy, not easy, try it. Try to criticize yourself. Immediately you will see how painful it is. And your advisor, they know it is painful, but that's the way to go. Okay, so for you, the transition can be very difficult. If you cannot make it, quit as soon as possible. If you cannot tolerate criticizing yourself, create as soon as possible, because this is very, very critical. Right. And the third, the fourth point is self-editing. I just said, write six hours a day. Writing is editing. And editing is self-editing. How to do self-editing? Read it keep writing it, keep rewriting it, right? Until you feel physically sick, you feel nauseous. And the way to do so is to just, just keep doing it. Now, if you haven't ever had the experiences of uh, feeling sick about your own writing, you're not a good researcher. I can, I can, I'm absolutely, absolutely sure about that. If you're a good researcher, if you're a good writer, you must have experience of being sick about your own writing. You can no longer stand reading it one more time. Okay, that's the golden standard. Easier said than done, right? Let me move on. I just mentioned that uh, uh, life is a science, life is an art. <laughs> Uh, if you're interested in knowing more about the RC part of life, RC aspect of life, uh, of course, the best way to go is to read philosophy. And read people like Nietzsche, like Schopenhauer. But if you focus on the science part of life, then you need to learn something about the brain science, the brain study. Uh, because our brain is wonderful. It's a wonderful instrument, very mysterious. How our brain works, nobody knows. Everybody has to figure out how your own brain works. Otherwise, you either damage it, ending up with probably even permanent damage. Uh, a more realistic risk is that you don't actually make the best of your brain power, right? And I can tell you one thing about uh, brain science or the, the, uh, the research findings about the brain, which is never ever think that sleep is a waste of time. 
sleep is our most important friend in our life. If you don't sleep well, you don't live well, you don't work well. Because only when our brain sleeps, or when we sleep, our brain helps us. So the way we do academic work is to prepare to run a very long marathon. But every day is a marathon. We get started, we keep running, and when we stop at the right time, let me ask you, when do you stop your one day's work? When you are exhausted or when you still can think very clearly? You're still excited, but you have passed the peak. Don't wait until you are totally exhausted. Don't wait until you are totally fed up. Stop working while you are still interested in what you want to do. That is science, right? Because after working intensely, you should have the courage to let go. Now don't underestimate the difficult of relaxing. It's very difficult to relax. It's a struggle to relax, but you have to relax. Okay, now let me show you a short video clip. This is Professor Andrew Wiles who proved uh, Fermat's last theorem. Uh, this is uh, during a interview, he talked about how he works. So based on your experience, could you describe a little bit this interplay that we were already discussing between this hard and persevering work on your desk on the one side, on the other hand, sometimes sudden flashes of insight that come out in a more relaxed atmosphere and where it's difficult to see where they come, come from, but making it clear that you must have worked unconsciously further on what you have been doing with your, with your pencil before. I think what you do is you get to a situation where you know a theory so well, maybe there's more than one theory that you know so well, and you've seen every angle, you've tried lots of different things, and you can just see the you're connecting five dots if they're sort of five places away from each other you can't do if they're one dot away it's automatic and somehow you just develop such an intuition um, and understand these objects so well that you can see where they have to fit together and this final insight is not something you rationally think out I mean, there's this tremendous amount of work in this preparatory stage where you have to understand all the details and all these different samples. Um, and then when you've developed all this, then you let the mind relax. And then at some point, maybe you go away and do something else for them, but you come back and suddenly it's all clear, like, I'll do that. And this is something the mind has. Very, very mysterious, right? So respect the brain power, trust it, work on it, use it, and then let go. I think some of you may have sleeping problem, which is very common among graduate students. Some of you may have anxiety, right? You feel anxious about your, uh, your life or, or, your, or your study. So we know that doing research is very difficult, like Professor Andrew Wiles just said. The brighter side of working hard is that you get ready for something difficult. Eventually, if your topic, if your research is really valuable, it will pay off. But before you reach that point, be prepared for frustration. Now here's a very nice quote uh, by Aristotle. Suffering becomes beautiful when anyone bears great calamities with cheerfulness, not through insensitivity, but through greatness of mind. All of you have great minds. 
Whether you can achieve beauty is another matter, but all of you have great minds. So the, 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 uh, the bridge between having great minds and beauty is perseverance. Working, working, and working. Choose important topic, but get ready to be bitten by the topic you choose because all major uh, research problems, they will fight back. So this is a very nice quote by a Danish scholar uh, called uh, Pete Hein. Problems worthy of attack prove their worth by fighting back. Let's now see how Fermat's theorem fought back on Professor Andrew Wiles. It's a very, very uh, interesting video. Um, that was a wonderful painting after seven years. So it really solved my problem when I finally done it. Only later did it come out that there was a, a problem at the end. That was time to be refereed, which is to say for people uh, appointed by the journal to go through and make sure the thing was really correct. The first seven years I worked on this problem, I loved every minute of it. However hard it has been, there have been, there've been setbacks often, there have been uh, things that had seemed insurmountable, but it was a kind of private, uh, a very personal battle I was engaged in. And then after there was a problem with it, doing mathematics in that kind of uh, rather overexposed way, uh, certainly not my style, my no wish to repeat it. At the beginning of September, I was sitting here at this desk when suddenly, totally unexpectedly, I had this incredible revelation. It was the most, uh, the most important moment of my working life. Nothing I ever do again. I don't want to do it again. Okay, so trust me, if you choose to become a scholar, you will have a lot of experiences of seeing that manuscript dropping on desk. It's terrifying. Everybody, every scholar knows how, how it feels. It got rejected. Or somebody found a fatal mistake in your paper. You don't know how to fix it, right? But keep working. And keep faith. What's the difference between confidence and faith? The difference is that confidence can be reasoned. Faith cannot be reasoned. You just keep your faith. So Professor Andrew Wiles is one of my favorite mathematicians, not because I know anything about math, but because it's very philosophical. It's very articulate. So if you want to learn more about uh, Andrew, Professor Andrew Wiles, go on YouTube, you'll find a lot of videos. Very interesting to watch. Right. Now this is the last slide. What is this life of a scholar? Some of you may choose to go into academia. Now before you do that, ask this question. What is the life of a scholar? Now, Aristotle, I mentioned a few minutes ago, is one of the greatest philosophers in human history. Martin Heidegger was one of the greatest philosophers, most, one of the most influential philosophers in the 20th century. So when commenting on the life of Aristotle, 
Martin Heidegger made this very pithy, concise summary. Where would the born? Arbeited or stopped? That's the life of a scholar. If you choose, face it, know it beforehand. If you choose other career, I hope my talk today is still of some use to you. Okay, now I'm ready to hear your comments and answer your questions. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Lee, for this enlightening talk. Uh, I think today is really a very precious opportunity uh, for you guys to have uh, to communicate with Professor Lee. So yeah, so I will pass the microphone around. Anyone who has questions, comments. Uh, thank you for this very lovely talk. I just wanted to like it's question slash comment because um, I'm going through this disillusionment of the comment you said in the beginning, right? Like it's a business, academia, it's, it's an industry. I'm slowly coming through this disillusionment and trying to find peace with it. But given the fact, even if you come to accept it's a business, it's an industry, how much of that do we have to accept? Because at some point, I think the second point, I really love a lot of stuff you said, but the second point you said, like, it's about competitive uh, comparisons <laughs> and coming in this cultural landscape where I find myself now in this last year. It is already quite, you know, this this comparison, this competition. Do I? And I I think this is not sustainable. I think we have to challenge these norms. I think it's time to do collaborations instead, especially for a lot of us. You know, I don't want to point the geopolitical imaginations we come from, but most of us in this room we come from quite a struggling geopolitical imagination. We were taught to fight. We're taught to you know like step over each other. And I think now, isn't this the time that we undo those, like undo these comparisons, undo this, like, okay, if you're doing something which I'm doing instead of, you know, me stepping out or you stepping over me, why don't we collaborate? Why don't we do this horizontally? Well, uh, I agree with you, but there is nothing we can do, <laughs> unfortunately. But the way out, I don't want to be, uh, uh, no other sound totally pessimistic, the way out of this ruthless, sometimes senseless, meaningless competition or rivalry is to take another look, a fresher look at academic career. In addition to comparing yourself with other people, always compare yourself with your older self. Yeah. With what you were yesterday, with what you were last year, so the point of life is not to reach an external goal, it's self-realization, right? So as long as you are improving yourself, you're making yourself a better and a better person, developing your intellect, developing your personality, that's the value of, birth, of, of, you know, of uh, academic life, right? I hope uh, you, know, you don't get too frustrated. There, there are a lot of things we cannot do. <laughs> there are a lot of things we can do nothing about. But still, as long as we are confident about ourselves, focus on yourself, focus on our self-development. You can just drive. Professor, I just want to ask when we are writing our, uh, our words, how can we uh, deal with the feeling that we are still not well prepared? For example, when I'm doing the literature review, after I review all the like the existing literature of other scholars, I just I, I'm just wondering uh, if my understanding should their work is correct or not. If I have some uh, other misunderstanding, is my uh, work uh, uh, how do you say we are prepared to you know to to submit to a journal to a, a conference or not? Uh, how how, do, how can we deal with this kind of feeling? Okay, now the answer is you can never get fully prepared. Um, a common mistake or common error among graduate students is somehow believe that the literature is the authority or the literature is the truth. That's wrong. 
the literature is a dialogue. So the point of reviewing a literature is to join a dialogue. It's not to learn anything because you are already doing PhD degree. If you are still learning from reading literature, that's too late. You read literature to engage it. So you don't learn anything from the literature. You focus on what you study. You focus on what you are doing research on, right? And that is not a literature. After you gain some new insight, you have the key word, after. After you have gained some new insight, after you have work through your insight, thoroughly on your insight, you feel so sure that you have made a breakthrough. You have come up with something totally new, totally you know, creative, original. Then you start reading literature. Never ever do serious literature review before you attack your own problem because you get discouraged. You read a paper, especially papers published in good journals, your starting point is that I want to find something false, something wrong with it, some loophole, some gap. Trust me, you won't be able to find it. Because all of those papers have gone through rigorous referee. Right? If there are problems, they have been detected. If there are easy, easy gaps, everybody can see it. So attack your problem, do research, Think very carefully, write very carefully. And only when you feel confident that you have done something truly extraordinary, let's start reading literature. Why? Why do we have to wait so long? Because if you come up with a new insight, you haven't worked it through, thought it through. Like you have reached like 50% or 60%. When you start reading literature, immediately you find a paper that has done 80%. What conclusion do you draw? I'm not creative. I'm not good enough. I work so hard and I have gone so far and they already went farther. So do focus on your own work. Wait until the last moment to read the literature. It's, it's almost like uh, climbing up a mountain only after you are confident you have reached the peak, then start reading the literature. Then you will immediately see some papers are really good, but not as good as yours, right? And if you want to wait until you are ready, you are never ready. So the only way to find out if you are ready or not is to try it. So being rejected, being asked to revise, being tormented by reviewers is part of our life. You cannot avoid it. So don't even dream about this. You know, I'm fully ready. I submit my paper. In three weeks, I will hear good news. But that's over overestimating your talent. You are no most of us well, Probably none of us, it's Zhang Yitang, none of us is that great genius. <laughs> we have to be patient. We have to learn from our own painful experiences. So uh, compared to most other professions, uh, uh, most research in social science and humanities produce, most of the research uh, produce little to no immediate impact. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, a journalist would write a story and publish next day, Thousands of people read. Uh, an engineer built things, or a patient jury, um, or a doctor heal people, right? Uh, but in research in social science and humanities, usually we end up in an obscure journal that mostly the academics will read. So, my question is in your research life, have you ever dealt with questions like if the research you're doing is really meaningless? If, if there is such questions, how do you deal with that? 
That's a very good question. Uh, now, I like uh, I like watching how mathematicians think about it, their own research. I, I like their model or like their, their philosophy, which is if my research is useful, good. If it's not useful, good too. <laughs> right. So we are doing science. We are doing science. That means we are not looking for uh, publicity. We are not looking for business success. So we are focusing on something that is transcend each individual. So here is uh, why Aristotle is so important because he argues or he believes that why do we do academic research? We do research for the sake of research. If we have found something new, then our finding becomes a part of a larger human soul. That sounds mysterious, but just look at ourselves. Now, I'm pretty old, you are very young, but in 100 years, none of us will be here anymore. What's left? What can be left over, what can survive our physical life, is our spiritual life. Have we contributed anything to that huge, ever-present, permanent human soul? If it's there, that's our internal life. Right. So if you are doing social science, if you are doing humanities or natural science, think this way. Otherwise, you will feel that your personal life is meaningless. Meaning, meaningless. So I'd like to make one point here. A living, a career, a calling. If you have never heard that mysterious calling, academia is not good for you. Right? If you only want to have a comfortable life, choose a different career. If you cannot even make a decent living for your family, don't do academic job. It's your, it's your responsibility. It's your duty to make a decent living for your family. The reason is that you know, if you choose to become a scholar, your family is bound to make some sacrifice on your behalf. So you owe them a lot, right? And the uh, Professor Andrew Wiles actually says something to the effect of the fact that you focus on your research doesn't mean you, you have the privilege, you have the right to make people around you have a miserable life. Right. So all of you, especially gentlemen sitting here, do bear this in mind. If you are unable to make a decent living for your family, don't go into academics, period. So a living, a career, a calling, they go together. If they don't go together, think twice. So, in short, we just need to philosophize our struggles and self doubt, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so much. I have to say that it was honestly, it felt like we are sitting under this cascade of philosophy early morning and we were gently touching our toes. So, thank you very much for that. Um, I don't know if there is a secret mission to convert all of us <laughs> from the PhD students to saints, and I feel like running to the mountains after this session. Uh, I hope not. <laughs> so uh, I have two questions, uh, but I'll, I'll stick to one first. One is, uh, thank you for your first slide that you had, and I'm thanking you because uh, through the course of your presentation at times, I was disappointed because you exposed us to the harsh realities of what our future might look like. I'm happy that there is nobody from HKDFS listening to you, so I'm happy. <laughs> so we'll still be paid for that. But thank you. Uh, on a lighter note, your first slide says that we will become our own advisors, right? Now, I am a married man. So I had left the responsibility of giving advice to my wife. So finally, I can take back control. Thank you for that. But why do you say that 
making a career and making a life and this calling are only exclusive concepts to PhD. Uh, and then I think if we go to uh, any field, any other field in our lives, I think the same question will be there. So what is this exclusive struggle that PhD would have to suffer? I guess in any, for example, I was working as a journalist uh, and then you know, one would say that I had no life, all the luxuries, but no personal life in that sense. So why uh, are you being too pessimistic about being PhD or being in academia? Well, uh, thank you. Uh, those are wonderful comments and a wonderful question. Being a PhD is pretty unique position because the point of studying for a PhD degree is really to prove something. We don't like proving ourselves, especially at my age. I always tell people, if I haven't proven myself, I can no longer prove myself, right? But being a PhD, you have to prove yourself. Prove yourself of what? Prove that you can do something unique. Nobody else can, right? You can be a very successful businessman, but other people can do the same. So you're not unique. I'm, I'm glad that you agree with me that uh, all the challenges, all the problems I talk about are universal. Not only for PhD students, not only for scholars, but for every human being. That's true. But I, I'm not supposed to brag about my own talk. But that's the, the hidden point is that become your own advisor is a good advice for everybody. It's like become your own boss. If you work for, for a company as an employee, then you need to become your own boss, right? If you're a student, become your own advisor. If you work for the government, at least imagine you are the top leader. At least imagine you are the top leader. If you are the chief executive, what are you going to do? If you are the US president, what are you going to do? I don't give more examples for obvious reasons, <laughs> right? But that is the way of making our humble, you know, very mundane life more meaningful. We think big, we think bigger, we think great, right? Now the beauty of having uh, academic career is that other than ourselves, we don't have a micromanager. I hate micro micromanagement because being academic means a lot of freedom. Imagine what other professions are better than being academic. You're on your own. If we are teaching, you teach your own way. If you do research, you do research in your own way. Right? All of you remember a very, very famous sound. I did it my way. You can do it your way. That's the beauty of pursuing academic career. But of course, it's a privilege. No other people in other business have so much autonomy, so much freedom. Imagine, I always tell my, tell my students, Sometimes they say that they are fed up with academic job and they don't want to do academic job. I always say, congratulations. Because if you don't want to pursue an academic career, that means you are more capable than me. For me, the only way to survive is to go into academia. No choice, right? But the second thing I will tell them is be prepared for the hardship. Right. Once you compare being a scholar with doing other jobs, then you will immediately become more appreciative. Right. My favorite example is working as a taxi driver. How stressful is it to be a taxi driver? He or she never knows when or where the next customer may pop up. He has no idea or she has no idea where he where, where you have to drive to. No idea how much money you can make, right? 
that kind of a life is much, much more stressful, much, much more anxious than the life of a scholar. Right, so become a, your own advisor is a general advice, not only for PhD students, but for everybody. Now, whether you end up in academia, yeah, I, I actually, I don't care. But I do care about one thing. Set up a goal that is larger than yourself. Care about something that is greater than your own immediate interest, right? Because that's the way to lift up our life. Our life is so limited. Try to make it more superior, more transcendental, and more spiritual. No, I, re I really start talking like a philosopher. <laughs> Thank you, Professor, for that presentation. Uh, I have a quick inquiry. Given the kind of work that you've been doing with governments, how much of social science research gets translated into policy that you have seen in your career? Rather, rather are we just doing it for our own good and then make money and teach again a bunch of students? Mm -hmm. And then governments will keep doing what they think they will do? Or how much of that interface is actually alive? Thank you. OK. Uh, that's a good question, but a tough one. Uh, but the first question, no. Uh, uh, the second question is that I actually do feel proud of my research because I, during my whole career, almost 30 years now, I do manage to gain a better understanding of my own country, uh, China, Chinese politics, Chinese culture, political system. Sometimes, I feel quite ambivalent, right? On the one hand, I do feel proud of my own findings. On the other hand, I wish I didn't know because it's painful to know. Oftentimes, it's very painful to know more about, your own, about yourself, about people you care, about your own country, right? So the only comfort is that Having knowledge out there may sometime work. When it will work, I have no idea. But I have contributed something. I know that some of my research findings will definitely survive me. Right? And that is the value of my career. As for the incumbent government, or even future government, whether they like it, or dislike it, reject it, accept it. There's nothing I can do about it, so I don't care. Well, actually, I think many of the students here are facing the challenge of choosing an appropriate dissertation topic. So I was wondering, Professor Lee, do you have any suggestions for them? Uh, the word appropriate is important. I, appropriate means important. Right. I don't want to repeat uh, why it is so important to choose something that is important. Now, you need to think about how to measure importance. I am a political scientist. I'm a China scholar doing research on Chinese politics. I have two standards for measuring importance. There is a highest standard and there's a lowest standard, maximum, minimum. At the very minimum, the top leaders care about your research or have, should care about your research. The president, the general party secretary, the premier, they should care about my research. Whether they care or not, not my business, but they should. That is the lowest standard. Highest standard, maximum criterion, Ordinary Chinese people like me care about it. If they don't care, you are doing something meaningless. Right? So that's the, that solves the uh, uh, part of the problem of importance, but that's not all. I mentioned to you that academia is, like, is an exclusive club. 
if you're doing research on Chinese politics, there is a community, there is a club we may call China Studies. And there are important scholars in that club. They are the gatekeepers. The topic you choose must be valuable to them. If they don't find it's valuable, it's valueless. There's no room for argument. You may say this is this is like uh, uh, like dictatorship. This is like authoritarian rule, not science. But trust me, science has no room for democracy. Science is ruled by merit. Right? If you do something valuable, people will, will recognize because by recognizing you, they actually recognize themselves. You are doing something that is relevant to their research. So this is the, the second way for you to uh, size up the topic you want, to, you want to do and try to determine whether it's meaningful or not. And this is where your advisor play a very important role. You need to talk to him, talk to, talk to her. Right? Because by definition, your advisor is a survivor in academia. They, they know the game. Uh, if you are honest with them, they will be honest with you. Right? If, if you are not honest with your advisors, they don't have the obligation to be honest with you. So to choose a good dissertation topic is a very, very difficult challenge. In addition to choosing something important, you also need to know whether you can do the best job on this topic. And that is the point of comparing, right? For instance, I started my academic career doing research on rural China, on the Chinese countryside. Why? Because I grew up in the countryside. I can talk to my family members, I can talk to my relatives, can talk to my uh, former classmates, my friends, my neighbors. There was no, there was no barrier. They have no reason to lie to me. They have no reason to mistrust me. So I know exactly what is actually going on. If you grew up in the countryside, you want to do research on labor politics, probably that's not a good choice, right? Similarly, if you want to do a quantitative analysis, you don't have access to uh, good survey data, uh, or if you want to do a big data analysis, you don't master the necessary technique, that's wrong choice. Right? So all of those things are very difficult to talk about generally. And that's why when I was teaching at the Chinese university, I offered a course on research method, right? and the whole course is devoted to choosing your topic and deciding whether you can do the best possible job. In academia, this is the cruel part of academic research. Only the best matters. Second best, losers. You can only win once. So it's even tougher than professional athletes. Scholars have to keep doing new things. An athlete can create a new world record and go to another game, still be the champion, but failing to break his or her own record. Academics, one game, that's the end of it. Success or fail, success or fail. One success leads to another challenge. You can never build on your previous successes. But that's also the beauty of academic work. So do talk to your advisor, uh, don't trust me. <laughs> don't trust me. Thank you. So any more questions or comments? Okay. So if not, uh, again, let's give a big hand. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so that's the end of today. Thank you.